of the truth. Good morning. I, I was testing the waters because I speak just a little bit louder than my son does, so I didn't want to blow us out of here. So, oh, so as Brody had said, I hope everyone has had a wonderful Fourth of July weekend. I know it's been a little different, and uh, Jennifer was making sure that I didn't play a drum solo during that song. Um, normally, we sing that chorus twice. And, you know, drummers are creatures of habit. We don't read music. We don't follow directions very well, do we? <laughs> so, on Thursday, I had a little solo going on, but she made sure I wouldn't do that today. So, uh, anyways, um, you know, God is just so amazing, so wonderful all the time that uh, there's all kinds of expressions out there, but one that I want to kind of come back to and focus on right now is do you put your money where your mouth is and by that we show our with our actions and not just our words what we support and what we believe in it's easy to say we believe God will provide but how we use our money shines a piercing spotlight on whether we truly trust him in all aspects of our lives 
In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says we cannot love both God and money. Each is a powerful master and motivator. But we can prove which one comes first in our heart through the following actions. Do you tithe? Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there be, may be more food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I, see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. In this commandment, with an astonishing promise, we see how God, He shows us that if we love and trust Him in everything, bringing the first 10% to Him, you won't believe how far the next 90% will go. You know, so, but it's, it's bringing it in so it's a powerful act of faith because we're putting God first, which is here at home in His church. That puts Him first. So, He says he, that with doing this, we can help provide for specific needs. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. When we decide in advance that we are going to be generous, we are ready to meet the needs God brings across our paths. You know, it starts here, and then it goes out. Because maybe it's that person that's in front of you at the grocery store, and you see them taking things off and setting them back down because... The bill's more than what they can do. Maybe God will have blessed you at that point that you can say, hey, put that back up there. I'll give you, I'll, I'll help you with that. Maybe that's it. Or maybe it's that, that, uh, that, that college student it's at the gas station, and, uh, you know, he's, he's pulling in and he's pumping in $2. Well, that'll only get you to the next gas station. You know, maybe you can help him out or her out. Maybe you have thought about it this way. Proverbs 22, 7 says, well, how about getting out of debt? You know, because the rich rules over the poor. The borrower is the slave of the lender. So if we're continually having to borrow and borrow and borrow, that money is, is starting to drive us. We show God we trust him to provide and we prove that we can be good stewards of what he has already given to us when we avoid getting too far into debt or work to get out of it as soon as possible. How about living contently? You know, 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Marketers spend millions of dollars trying to convince us that we need something, that we need that next big thing. You know, don't fall for that lie. God is, is, is all our souls need. We need to be looking up. We need to be looking forward to Him and striving to do more what makes Him happy. And then that will make us happy. And in the long run, if we get content with what we've already got, we're going to see our stress levels start to lower because we're not having to worry about how to pay for that next big thing. So if, if we don't fret about finances, Jesus tells us this, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's Matthew 6, 33. Having our priority straight generates peace in our hearts that spills over into how we treat others. And when we treat others well, we can have the opportunity to bring them to the Lord. Because bringing them to the Lord is what our goal should be. You know, we need to show others that we're different. So at this time, that you would be bringing your gifts as you're preparing your heart to give your gifts. Just be focused upon Jesus and, and God and giving to Him first and being content with what He has given us and thanking Him for all the blessings. Will you pray with me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, Father, we thank You so much for the blessings that You have given us and for this church to come and be able to worship. Father, whether we are worshiping here in person or worshiping online, we just thank you so much for all that you have given us and uh, all the blessings. Father, but most of all, we thank you for sending your son. And it's that great and awesome third day. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
The Bible, it's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story, inspired by the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Rin grabbed a handful of granola bars from the pantry and tossed them in her duffel as Aunt Dina watched. I don't know if they'll have snacks there. Aunt Dina raised an eyebrow and took a sip of coffee. Is it one of those church games? I guess. I, I mean, Jess invited me. It's in the mountains. It sounds cool. You're gonna have to shape up, you know. You don't go to church like them. Hey, I don't get in trouble. Rin's aunt grinned and shook her head. <laughs> Whatever you say, hun. Rin's mom breezed in with a rain poncho and handed it to Rin. Come on, Dina. Rin's a good kid, and she's gonna have a great time. There's Jess. You go and have fun. It was a three-hour trip up to Camp Hickory. Jess and her mom chattered away, but Rin couldn't help thinking about Aunt Tina's offhanded comment. I do mess up a lot. Images scrolled through Rin's head like scenes from a film. The times Rin snapped at her little brother. Go away, Keegan, you're such a pain. That time last week when mom shut off Rin's internet access. That is so not fair. And Rin snuck the password off of her mom's phone. And that exam where she accidentally saw the answer off of her friend's test and wrote it down anyway? I shouldn't have done that. Hey, Rin, we're almost there. Jess's cheerful voice cut into Rin's thoughts. She tried to smile as she looked out out the window at the winding mountain road and high blue sky. Great! Rin's worries haunted her as they checked in and made their way to the cabin. These kids all go to church. They know the right stuff to say and do. Rin glanced over to see Jess struggling with her oversized duffel and backpack. She decided it was time to level up. Hey, let me get that for you. But you've got... I can do it. Rin staggered toward the cabin, hauling both of their bags. Inside, they met their counselor, Sally. Hey there, I think this is all of us now. I'm really sorry, but the bottom bunk by the door is kind of creaky. We usually draw straws to see who will sleep there. I'll take it. What? Oh, well, that's great. At dinner, Rin looked out for more ways she could blot out the memories of her mistakes. They ran out of cherry cobbler. Here, you can have mine. When Sally spilled her water. Oops, I'll just. I got it. I'll run over to the kitchen and get a towel. After dinner, everyone hiked the half mile toward the outdoor amphitheater for the evening gathering. Rin's eyes darted back and forth, looking for more ways to help. Hey, you can slow your roll now. Sally fell into step with Rin, who grinned sheepishly. This is all kind of new for me. <laughs> me too. It's my first year as a counselor. It's just, everyone here has gone to church forever. They've got it all together. <laughs> Trust me, they don't. I don't. But at least they know the rules, the right stuff to do. Rin, you have been incredibly helpful and kind since you got here, which is awesome. But you don't have to do everything perfectly to fit in. At camp? Yeah, at camp, but also with God. That's what this week is about. Having fun and relaxing, knowing that it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. God totally loves and accepts you anyway. Rin frowned as she hopped over a fallen log across the trail. I lied to my mom last week. Well, own up to it. She'll still love you, and it sure won't change how God feels about you. <laughs> Not to be all churchy, but can I tell you this verse I love? Sure. It's the first thing I read when my friend Carl gave me a Bible three years ago. God's grace has saved you because of your faith in Christ. Your salvation doesn't come from anything you do. It is God's gift. It is not based on anything you have done. No one can brag about earning it. Christ, that means Jesus, right? Yeah, we'll talk about all that this week, but just know you can't work for God's love. He already loves you completely. Whether or not you lie to your mom or take the creaky bunk or give away your dessert. It just feels like, I don't know, I should have to do something. I know, right? But just letting God love you, that's the most important thing. Doing good stuff comes after knowing how loved you are. 
Rin took a deep breath trying to take it all in. As the dust began to settle, she saw a large campfire ahead with rows of benches. Jess waved. Hey, Rin, we saved you a seat. Rin turned back to Sally. Do you have a place to sit? Go ahead. I'll see you for s'mores after. Rin jogged over to the bench where Jess and the other girls from the cabin were sitting. It was a lot to process, but for the first time all day, she felt like she could relax because she knew there was nothing she had to do to fit in. Good morning, good morning. It is good to gather as God's people. I was reading through Core 52 when I decided that, yeah, this would be a good series to build our sermons on. And I came to this chapter and I thought, man, I wonder if I can just skip this one. And uh, then I thought, no, that'll raise more questions than, than not. Election and predestination, a, a theological uh, doctrine, uh, something that the church has actually divided over many times since the uh, 16th century in the Reformation. Uh, you may have heard of John Calvin, the Swiss reformer who emphasized the sovereignty of God. God is in charge and therefore everything unfolds in accordance with His predetermined will. It's kind of fatalistic, if you will. It, not an opposite to that, but a balance to that was set forth by Jacob uh, Arminius, who said, within the sovereignty of God, man has free will. Just as Adam and Eve in the garden were told, don't eat of this one tree. You can eat anything else. But they had an opportunity to respond to God. I think it's important, though, that we understand that we don't get confused. And I'm going to try, as Mark Moore did in his book, Core 52, to build from Matthew chapter 22 and the parable of the marriage feast of the Lamb. I want to take you back, first of all, though, to my childhood. Um, if, if it wasn't filled with school or the mowing of lawns, it was spent with pickup games of baseball, basketball, or football there was kind of a pasture next to our elementary school that had at one time been the high school baseball diamond, but it had been overgrown, and that's just simply where we went to play. I was a decent baseball player, a so-so basketball player, and a really downright bad football player. But I do remember those pickup games. And if you've ever been in those situations, you know how it unfolds. You have two captains usually the best players, the most athletic, and they're going to pick their teams from the pool of kids standing before them. <clears throat> the better players are picked in quick fashion. Everybody knows who they are. The mediocre players are waiting, knowing that they'll be picked, but hoping they're not overlooked. And the rest, well, they just hope they wouldn't be the last one picked. Because the last one picked carries a certain stigma, doesn't it? You could even see in their eyes the thoughts that were in their minds. Please, please, please pick me. Pick me. Such were the thoughts, I think, of some who look at election and predestination with an errant view. They're like the poor kid at the side who are just going, oh, I hope, I hope, please pick me, please pick me, don't leave me out. Mark Moore chooses to focus on verse 14. I'm going to read the entirety of the parable, but the verse that says, for many are called, but few are chosen. And he tries to help us understand that. I hope that you're reading through Core, 15, or core 52 and, and can pick up on some of the things that Mark builds upon. I'm not going to touch on everything that he has in his book. But I want us to approach this with grace. Let me tell you another story and then I'll launch into the parable. A dear friend of mine, one of my very best friends, was Jerry Hayward. He and his wife, Kathy, 
uh, were killed by a drunk driver a number of years ago. Uh, Jerry was a minister. Uh, they were ministering in Pennsylvania uh, when the accident happened. For a while, he actually preached here in the Peoria area at the Charter Oak Bible Church. Jerry, as he studied, moved more and more toward the position that, say, John Calvin would have presented in terms of predestination. I moved more and more towards the position of Jacob Arminius. And so it was funny. We did not agree on a theological tenet, but we walked together as brothers with a deep brotherly affection. He was a Christian, I am a Christian, and we shared fellowship. And I always liked the way that we would close our meetings, whether we were in person and giving each other a hug before we headed our separate ways or we had been on the telephone. I would usually say something to the, te uh, to the effect of, you know, Jerry, you're a Calvinist because you choose to be one. To which he would reply, well, Bill, you're an Arminian because God made you one. Now, that may not mean anything to you unless you understand the theology behind it, but Calvin would have said, no, you don't choose you were made. And so when I said, Jerry, you're a Calvinist because you choose to be one, it was kind of a backhanded slap at his theology. Arminius would have said, hey, you're a Christian because you choose to follow Christ, not because God made you follow Christ. And so when he would say, hey, Bill, you're an Arminian because God made you one, it was a little bit of a backhanded slap at mine. And we would laugh. And like I said, we lived in brotherly affection. And I miss Jerry dearly, miss him dearly. My point is this, <laughs> there may be Christians that we disagree with, but we need to remember that old tenet of the restoration movement of the Christian churches of which we're a part, that in essentials unity, there are doctrines on which we cannot move to the right or the left. We must stand firm upon the faith once for all delivered to the saints, as Jude puts it. But there are many areas in our faith which are open to opinions. And when it's an area of opinion, we need to have respect for one another and maintain the bond of fellowship. And that in all things, in all things, there is love. In essentials, unity. In opinions, liberty. In all things, love. So that's kind of a funky and lengthy introduction. But I want to read for you this parable from Matthew chapter 22. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying... The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fattened livestock are all butchered. Everything's ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention, and they went their way. One to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers. 